This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation with theoretical physicist Sean Carroll, author of From Eternity to Here, The Quest for the Ultimate Theory of Time. It's the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. Sean Carroll is a theoretical cosmologist specializing in dark energy and general relativity at the California Institute of Technology. He's also a blogger at Cosmic Variance and the author of the new book, From Eternity to Here, The Quest for the Ultimate Theory of Time. Sean, welcome to the program. Thanks. I was reading one of the Q&As you've done before about the book, and a reader sent in the question... I want to get this exactly right. Is is time real? Now, in what way does that, in what way is that a question that makes sense to ask? Well, I think the question you just asked is the right one, which is, you know, is that even a sensible question or what sense is it sensible? You know, what, you need to define what you mean by real. The short answer for me is that yes, time is real. And what I mean by that is that Every way that we have of thinking about the universe has time as a fundamental ingredient. It might be different in different ways of thinking about the universe. Time can mean different things in different circumstances. But I don't know of, number one, any way of thinking about the universe which doesn't even mention time at all. And number two, if you could come up with one, it would seem, I'm not quite sure what the advantage would be. I'm not quite sure what you're getting by that. I mean, clearly, you know, when we get together to talk on the phone, we arrange a time. When I that something lasts a certain duration that's measuring time. And so I think that time is very useful. I think that it's, it's, it's useful enough that I'm going to say that it's real and get on with my life. But what would lead somebody to want to consider, or not consider, um, what would lead them to want to be, maybe get partially on board with the idea that time might not be a real thing? Well, it's certainly a sensible um, direction to try to pursue because you never know when you're thinking about the universe at a sort of fundamental level, which concepts from your everyday experience are still going to be useful and which ones are not. I mean, we, you know, at the deep level, we think that stuff is made of elementary particles and atoms and so forth, even though we don't see them in our everyday lives. So I could at least have imagined that a really good description of the fundamental architecture of nature would not have time as a fundamental ingredient. But as far as I can tell, all the ones that we are thinking about these days that seem to be possibly successful do involve time. This question might sound a little grand, but it does feel apropos. How, how much is science, how much of the core mission of science is to correct for what our everyday perceptions might lead us astray? Well, that's a good question. I think that there's lots of different, I don't think there is a core mission of science other than understanding our universe, but there's various different reasons why you would like to understand our universe. There's a a sort of forthright idea that you would like to manipulate the universe better. You'd like to be able to control it, which means you can invent things. You can create better technology and so forth. There's another very separate motivation, which is purely curiosity-driven. You just want to know how things work. And obviously, these two things are very, very tightly intertwined because figuring out how things work purely on the basis of curiosity very often lets us uh, invent new things we wouldn't have otherwise conceived of. So, for example, when Einstein invented the general theory of relativity, he wasn't imagining that a different perspective on space and time and gravity was going to lead to any technological advances, but in fact we use general relativity to keep the global positioning system, our GPS satellites, on track. So the work that I do, trying to understand why time works the way it does, doesn't have any immediate application that I can possibly see, but who knows? We won't understand something better and put it to good use later. You were then driven by this, this, I I was going to say simple, but it's not really simple when you think about it, curiosity to understand the world in sort of a pure way, and that just, that brings you to a field that, who knows what consequences it could have when when you've discovered what you've discovered? Yeah, I think that's right, and I think that the motivation actually is simple. It really is just curiosity. It's, it's we human beings poking our noses in corners of the universe, uh, which don't present themselves to us readily. I mean, part of the reason why 
the findings of modern science often seem bizarre and fascinating to us is because the easy stuff we figured out, you know, the stuff that is, that is immediately uh, visible, a lot of it we understand how that works, and so we go to regimes that we need to build impressive machinery to get to, whether regimes literally very far away by building a rover that goes to Mars, or regimes that are sort of much higher energies or much colder temperatures or much faster speeds than we're used to in our everyday lives. Now, what can you tell us about the kind of curiosity that leads you in a book like From Eternity to Here to ask, why does time zero go forward and not backward? Because you mentioned in the book, I believe, that it's not the same it's not the same kind of question a lot of people in your field are asking. They tend to be more concentrated, correct me if I'm wrong, but on more micro issues, ones that come down to a lot of a lot of math and work, whereas this is more of a grand question. Is it a different kind of curiosity that asks this? I don't think it's really a different kind of curiosity. I think that at any in any one field of science, at any one moment in its history, almost all work is incremental. It's building slowly and carefully on the existing art. But there's still, there needs to be a place for stepping back and looking at the bigger picture and asking ourselves, what are the questions we should be asking? What are the problems we should be working on? What are the ways that we should be conceptualizing the issues in front of us? So, you know, it's very, very important to understand how perturbations in density in the early universe manifest themselves in observable things like the temperature of the cosmic background radiation or the statistics of galaxies in the universe. But it's also important to say, well, what would count as a respectable theory of how the early universe works? What are the problems we're trying to solve? What are the issues that are confronting us? And I think that starting with time in our kitchens, the arrow of time, the fact that entropy increases is a scientific way of saying it, why is the past different from the future? This leads us to a certain perspective about the early universe. It gives us a set of questions to answer that if you're going to tell me you have a theory for where the universe came from, it better answer these questions. Now, I was going to ask if you thought of the, I don't know if market is the right word, but if the sort of intellectual area about questions like the nature of the very early universe is underserved. I was going to ask that, but then probably because you've written the book, your answer is that it is underserved, right? I think, yeah, I mean, the, the market in explaining ourselves to the general public is not badly served. I think that there's um, a lot of great books on the market and so forth, but it is nevertheless still underserved. I think that uh, it's not as if there's one book that explains everything and then you move on and do other things. Different books appeal to different people. They approach different questions and so forth. And once you get past a certain tiny amount of resistance that, you know, life is short, I don't have time to read about the origin of the universe. <laughs> People are very excited about this stuff. I mean, the idea that the kinds of questions we could ask about the world back when we were six years old are nevertheless still interesting, and I can understand what all the world scientific thinkers are contemplating for these answers is an exciting one, and, and I think that people appeal to it, it appeals to people pretty directly. I should not say that just in terms of writing books, but all sorts of different media. I mean, I think there's different ways to get this message out, everything from sneaking in some good science to a major Hollywood blockbuster to um, writing on your blog an explanation of some news story that just recently appeared. Now, I think we, we've kind of gone on two parallel threads of inquiry here, one of them about the market for popular science books and especially popular physics, popular cosmology books, but another one about the this field of inquiry itself, this, this discussion of the origin of the universe. Is, is a discussion of the origin of the universe, is that more suitable to a book like this, one to be read by a wider audience, or is it... What I guess I'm asking is, is it, is it more suitable for a, a book the public will read, or is it more suitable for something, I mean, would you publish a paper on, not you specifically, but would one publish a paper on the origins of the universe these days and have something to report, uh, in a journal, for example? Yeah, no, I mean, most of my work certainly is of the form of writing articles that appear in journals. I've yes. written articles on the uh, topics discussed in this book, and I, I'm working on more as we speak. So, I mean, I think that I've never been someone who thought that the right approach to take to communicating to a general public was to wait 
until we had all the answers and then tell people what we thought. I think it's perfectly okay. In fact, it's frankly our duty to report on work in progress, especially if you're doing things like what I do for a living, which don't lead to tangible improvements in our standard of living or, you know, freedom from fossil fuels or anything like that. Uh, we get supported by the wider society to answer deep questions about the universe, and therefore it's our obligation to explain what our answers are. At the same time, that doesn't replace uh, writing technical papers, because if you don't write technical papers and you don't discuss at a very rigorous level with your colleagues what these ideas are and what their merits are, then you don't have anything to report back. So I don't think that the uh, right place for the technical scientific arguments is in a book for the general public, but I don't also think that the general public needs to wait until scientists have finished their technical arguing to get a peek about what the state of play is. What can you tell us about the challenge of writing this book where some of the material comes from areas on which you've published papers, but some doesn't, where there's that mixture there? Well, that's a big challenge. <laughs> I can tell you that, and I hope that I've gotten right. Um, of course, that, that challenge is part of the excitement and interest in this project to me. I was not simply starting sitting down with a blank piece of paper and typing things I knew. It was uh, absolutely uh, a certain amount of effort in reading the history of the subject and reading about subjects that were related to what I was really interested in but not really the same and nevertheless played a role in telling the complete story. And so that was great. I mean, that was you know truly intellectual work, understanding other people's work and trying to put it into words that made sense as part of the wider narrative of my own book. And, you know, like I said, I hope that I, I got it basically right, but certainly I, I tried to put different ideas together in a way that gives people an accurate representation of how they fit. Is it harder to do that sort of interpretation where you research the work of others and bring it to the public, or is it harder to bring your own work to the public? And that sounds like the answer is obvious, but it seems to me that it might be harder if it's something you have built your career on and you've spent your career in, that it might actually be, and this is just a guess, more difficult to put it into general public terms because of how, of how embedded in it you are. Well, I think, yes, you, you put your, your finger on something important there. I don't think that, in principle, it should be harder to explain what I work on every day to a general public than it should be to explain stuff that I've only recently been reading about. On the other hand, in practice, the stuff that I work on every day, I find myself explaining over and over again to different people in different contexts, to students and to people on the street, whatever. And therefore, when it comes to writing the book, it's less fresh to me, and it's actually more of an effort to do a good job. In fact, sort of the one or two chapters of the book that I think are my least favorites are the ones in things I understand the best. <laughs> Whereas when I got to, to explore ideas that I hadn't really put effort into ever explaining before, then it was really uh, fresh and vibrant to me. Now, I might look back 20 years from now and re realize that those chapters are not as good as they could have been, uh, but it was certainly fun to me and exciting, and I got to try out some new things. What strategies did you find to break past that sort of boilerplate of what you had gotten used to telling students, used to telling colleagues, used to explaining to anybody who asked about your own work? How could you, how could you make that fresh again? I think that the useful thing for me was that I was not simply writing a review of all the work that I'm interested in. I was really, I had a mission in the book. The book has a point, it has an argument to um, talk about the arrow of time as we observe it in our everyday lives connect it to the wider universe, and then ask what kinds of cosmological scenarios could possibly explain this line of reasoning. And so even when I was explaining things like dark energy or general relativity or black holes, things that I've explained in other contexts for other reasons many times before, in this case it was always for a purpose. It was not for the purpose of explaining black holes. It was the purpose of understanding what black holes could teach us about the arrow of time and what, what, what role they play there. So it was never exactly boilerplate. It was never exactly the usual explanation because it was always building an argument that took many chap chapters to build, but I think that we've eventually we got there. So it helped that then, if I have this right, because you were always approaching things from the angle of what does this tell us about time, that made it new? Yes, that's right. I mean, that means that there were things I didn't need to explain, other things I needed to go into more detail, 
other things I need to emphasize, certain aspects that I would have uh, brushed over in other presentations. What was the intellectual seed of this book? How far back can you trace it in your career? When did you begin thinking that it might be a good idea to start this, what's ended up as a large popular book about, about Time's Arrow itself? Well, the issue of explaining the arrow of time, which for operational purposes comes to explaining why our early universe was so orderly, so organized, and so low entropy, uh, was one that I first encountered when I was in graduate school in physics reading the works of Roger Penrose, who's a very famous and well-known mathematician and theoretical physicist. And he, for many years, since the 1970s, as far as I can tell, has been emphasizing that this is the primary problem that cosmology should be thinking about, and and professional cosmologists have not paid it nearly enough attention. And uh, I read some of Penrose's papers on the subject, and I sort of knew that he was saying some things that sounded right, but nevertheless, I was not moved to think that cosmologists should actually change the orientation of how they were thinking. But it percolated in the back of my mind for years and years. And um, in later years, as a postdoc, I read papers and books by Hugh Price, who's a philosopher in Australia, who very carefully pinpointed you know, where the cosmologists were cheating or where they were going wrong in their understanding of this problem. And it, it did become evident to me that this was something that cosmologists should be thinking about. But it wasn't until I was um, an assistant professor um, in the early, less than five years ago, that it really became something that I wanted to work on myself. And since then, I thought it was just an absolutely fascinating thing that is dramatically underserved in the uh, technical research community. And it eventually dawned on me that it would make a great story for a popular book because there is a lot to explain that people can really put their fingers on. You know, we do mix coffee and cream together, and we don't unmix them. It does not require some abstract explanation of extra dimensions or or the Big Bang or anything (laughs) like that, but it gets us there. Trying to explain why we mix coffee and cream together but don't unmix them is ultimately dependent on what happened at the Big Bang. So it's it's an interesting... So I thought that it was a great topic for a book because, number one, it covered a lot of different topics individually that were intellectually interesting. Number two, it connected together different parts of the story in ways that other popular books uh, about physics and cosmology didn't connect. And number three, it made an argument that I thought was, uh, was, I would hope that my professional colleagues would listen and respond to, not just um, the non-experts. And since you're known today as considering, of course, the book and the blogging that you've done as as a fine, clear communicator of, of your work, how early on did you consider that you might write for the reading public rather than simply for the field? Well, I didn't um, take it seriously as something I wanted to start doing early in my research career, but it was certainly always something that I contemplated doing because, like I said, what I do for a living isn't that useful to um, the standard of living of a typical person in the United States or the rest of the world. Uh, It's curiosity and it's figuring things out, and then there's just no point to do that unless you tell people what you figured out. And I'm a big believer in that there's an important role for professional journalists and writers, not just professional scientists. I think that good writers, uh, especially outside the specific field of science, can bring something to explaining these concepts that a scientist has trouble bringing. But there's also a role for professional scientists because they can certainly bring something that is hard for a writer to bring. They're just simply more familiar with the material at a detailed level than a writer could ever be. So I always thought that it was a good thing to do for the field, and I do enjoy doing it myself. So not, it's not for everyone. Uh, there's sort of some scientists I'm very happy if they stay away from talking to the general <laughs> public. But I think that uh, some of us have to do it, and I enjoy doing it, so why not me? Why do I hear that view so rarely articulated that, say, a publicly funded enterprise like certain branches of science then have an obligation to explain themselves and explain what's going on to the funding public? Well, I think that research does have um, other benefits. You know, there's a direct benefit to the world if, if scientific research moves forward, and there's a direct benefit more prosaically to universities if they have highly ranked research departments. And research is hard, and it's sufficiently hard that you want to, you're going to be better at it if you devote more of your effort to it. And 
so uh, there's a feedback loop which creates a system which valorizes technical achievement in very specific research areas at the exclusion of other things, just because if you're doing something else, you're not doing your technical research. So we don't, so I think that a failure of our modern academic system is that we don't create space for, at, at, you know, I'm talking specifically now about, let's say, the top 20 research universities in, in the country. They emphasize research so much that they don't make it easy to write popular books or even to do interdisciplinary research outside the traditional boundaries or, and things like that. That's not a disaster. You know, it ends up with us with really good research. And nevertheless, some of us, even at some of the best places in the country, are going to write these books anyway. Um, but it's, it's not easy, and, and I'm not exactly sure what the perfect balance is. I want to go back a little bit to the content of your book, and I did promise myself initially that I wasn't going to make you rehash verbally any of the things you you said in the book, but I then realized I'm coming at this from the perspective of somebody who's read the book, and I do, I do in a sense, need to forget that I've read it so mm-hmm. a listener can understand. Now, you've mentioned earlier on that the, the, cons- an arrow, the arrow of time moving in the direction it does is a consequence of the low entropy state of the early universe. Now, that itself... Explaining that to the public seems like that could fill an entire book alone. So what can you say about the challenge of of knowing how much groundwork to, to lay and knowing what sort of misconceptions to clear out before you can confidently say to yourself that you've, you've explained these things in a relatable way? Well, that's a great question. I think that the answer needs to be empirical rather than theoretical. I don't think you can sit down and decide ahead of time what misconceptions you need to clear up, what groundwork you need to lay, etc. And, I'm, of course, I'm not sure that I did it correctly because different readers will have different reactions. They'll be bored by certain parts. They'll be fascinated by other parts. And so I try to keep, you know, everything moving along at a certain rate, but I also talk to people. You know, I, ne- I had a lot of the readers that I asked to look at the manuscript for the book were not scientists. I specifically wanted feedback from people who were not not only not scientists, but not even the kind of people who read science books as a hobby. You know, not the people who already read The Elegant Universe and A Brief History of Time. So it's very, very useful to do that because you you have it's difficult for someone who is immersed in the subject to remember what it is like to not be immersed. I mean, it goes all the way back to what how we would define the word time. Physicists start defining the word time as some coordinate on a four-dimensional space-time manifold and can't imagine that you think of it any other way. <laughs> Whereas most people are going to think of time as something you know, through which we move, almost like a medium as the universe changes from moment to moment. And so connecting those, and that, that's you know, chapter one, but then in every chapter there's things that become immediately uh, clear or, and the importance of which is immediately obvious to a professional scientist, but you need to have a conversation with people who are not starting from the same point. Did anything surprise you about what the results, the feedback you'd get back after showing your manuscript to somebody who, as you mentioned, the type of person who didn't regularly read science books, didn't regularly read physics books? Uh, may- maybe they didn't, I don't know if you showed it to somebody who doesn't read a lot of books at all, but did they give you any, any responses that you didn't expect, that you wouldn't have thought of, or that, that never would have come to you had you not done that? I think that almost everyone gave me a response I didn't exactly expect. Otherwise, you know, it wouldn't have been as useful. But um, it, it, was, it was often the kind of thing where once I got the response, I would go, oh, yes, of course, that's kind of obvious. And, uh, I mean, nothing sticks immediately to mind. But, you know, my writing style on – I have a blog that I write on most days of the week. And it's just for fun. It's not serious. It's not um, – something that I sit and polish the prose or anything like that. I dash something off and I go on with my day. And that result, that's good because it means that it's easy for me to write. I just not agonize over getting words on the piece of paper. On the other hand, the style was kind of loosey-goosey and informal, and that works really well in a blog, and you need to tone it down a little bit in a book. I still try to keep things fun and moving quickly, but there are fewer exclamation points in the book than there would be in my everyday prose. So I got great feedback, everything from, you know, uh, what what does time mean? Why do I remember the past, not the future? To fewer exclamation points, maybe even a few fewer semicolons. And, but they didn't stop me from having a whole bunch of footnotes. So you know, they didn't convince me of all their suggestions are true. And there's a bunch of different ways that 
these issues, these complicated issues of time and of cosmology are made relatable in your book, one of which is the whole section at the back, the appendix simply called Math. Was that an early choice to put that all in the end of the book? Well, you need to make a choice about the tone of your book right from the start in terms of equations when you're going to write um, a physics book. So at at one extreme would just be, and it's, it's, it's an extreme, but it's the most common place to be, which is that you just say, no, equations are scary, you can't have them, nothing numerical should appear in a book if it's going to appeal to a broad audience. At the other extreme, you have, um, again, Roger Penrose wrote a thousand-page tome, The Road to Reality, where he says, you know, even if you don't know any math, I can teach it all to you from the start, and it, there's five equations on every page. So you need to pick a level and sort of stick to it, and I thought from early on that there were just you know one or two points where numbers and equations were important, not in any detailed way, not sort of difficult math, just algebra basically. But seeing the algebra, seeing the equation on the page, makes gives you an understanding if you if you put in the effort to understand what that equation is telling you that you just can't get from thinking about words. It's it's a different kind of understanding. So. Even though it's not for everybody, I put two or three equations in the book, and I said, you know, if you don't like these, skip over them, but you will really get something out of them by putting in the effort. I didn't want to just leave it there, so in the appendix, I talked both about logarithms and exponentials, the basic uh, algebraic operations that were put to work in the book, because, you know, it's Ludwig Boltzmann, who told us what entropy is, used a logarithm in his formula, and I wanted people to explain that, to be able to understand that. And then also there's a lot of numbers. When we're talking about cosmology and um, entropy and things like that, you often see numbers like 10 to the 100, okay, a 1 followed by 100 zeros. This is a number that's beyond our everyday experience, even when we're talking about the budget deficit. That's a, an unimaginably large number. So I wanted to just dis- sort of discuss what some of these numbers mean and put them in context and impress upon people how big they really were. And is it true you, you bring out the old saw in publishing that if... The, the, every every equation you use, your sales are then halved. How close to, to the truth do we know that to be? It's certainly not true because Roger Penrose sells a lot of books. Oh, his, yes. His books are full, full of equations. So I think that there's a, uh, there's a way to do it. I mean, I think that there's a way to, and I tried to do this in, you know, again, in some parts of the book, not most of it, but one or two times I sat down and said, look, here are equations. You don't deal with equations every day. But they're not that scary. If you just bear with me and follow the steps, you will really understand something in a much deeper way than you would otherwise. So, you know, some people, and I and I sympathize with them, are you know, just have the thought that I took math in high school and I hated it, and I don't want to actually go volunteer to learn more math right now. This is not what I'm interested in doing, and that's fine. I think it's a shame, but I do sympathize with it. But on the other hand, I hope that I can coax some people who don't use equations in their everyday lives to seeing that one or two quantitative statements here or there over the course of a 500-page book uh, is actually not detracting from the overall experience. It's adding something to it. And it's got to be tempting, then, to use more equations because using an equation, that that saves, what, a 20,000-word explanation, potentially, that that could translate to? Um, No, actually, it doesn't because the 20,000 words are still there to explain what the equations mean. I mean, I think that's crucially important, that I'm not using the equation to replace some ex- explanation in terms of words. It's just that when you... It, it, I, I see it all the time when people explain something in physics or cosmology or whatever in terms of words, then the listener naturally believes them. They think that those words are true, and they use that understanding of those words to apply it to some other question other than the original one that was being explained and it comes out being wrong because the words were not completely accurate. The words are always a translation. The words are always a, um approximation, you know, a rephrasing, a paraphrase of the actual, precise, underlying quantitative relationship. So I wanted to have both. I wanted to have the words in there where I was doing the best I possibly could to explain what was going on, but then there's an equation that you can fall back on that, that, is, that is absolutely right. It's not just a translation. And if you're confused, you can go back to that equation and hold on to it and ask, what does this equation tell me about the problem I'm interested in? It gives the reader two angles of understanding, you might say, on the same issue? That's right. And, you know, one is sort of more comfortable and, and full of words, and the other one, as long as you put the effort in, is going to give you 
the right answer. You mentioned a little while ago Ludwig Boltzmann, and in the book you also talk about Stephen Hawking, personal experience of interaction with him. You talk about Einstein, of course, and there is it's not a it's not a book filled with talk of the great personalities of science, but you certainly do bring them in, and you discuss what they what they were able to able to unearth, able to discover. And this seems to me, and tell me if I'm right or wrong about this, the use of personalities like that seems to be a somewhat controversial issue in science writing, whether it's something one should do or whether it's something one should not do because it distracts from the work. Where do you fall on the spectrum? Clearly, you don't mind including them. But does, it, does that ever become a danger? Well, I, didn't, I don't know if I think of it as a um, controversial topic, although I've noticed in reviews of the book, some of them say this book is is great because it doesn't bog itself down with too many talks of the personalities and stories about <laughs> great physicists. And other reviews say there's all these stories about individual physicists in there. This is terrible. <laughs> You've gotten and both. Others wow. say there's stories about individual physicists. This is great. You know, I mean, you get every possible uh, response along that line. So I guess there is some sort of hidden controversy of which I was not aware. I think that you know different readers respond to different things. So the book is certainly not a collection of biographical essays, uh, because that's not what I wanted to write. On the other hand, it's also not just a pristine logical edifice that, that tries not to get its fingers dirty by talking about real human events. I think that the real human events are real. They're part of the story. Science, the product of science is some clean theoretical edifice, but the practice of science is a messy thing done by real human beings with real concerns and real confusions, and, and I don't want to deny that. I think that's an important part of how we get there, especially because we're not there yet. You know, the story is not over, so there's going to continue to be personalities and mistakes and, and genius insights along the way, all from real human beings. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. You can hear this interview again or any other from the back pages at colinmarshallradio.com. My guest is theoretical physicist Sean Carroll, author of From Eternity to Here, The Quest for the Ultimate Theory of Time. And I'm tempted to add the story can't be over, can it? There's, there's no, maybe I'll ask, maybe this is an underlying philosophical sort of plank to individual scientists, but there's, there's no end to the story of scientific discovery, is there? I mean, these, these things can, you can always get one hair's breadth closer to the truth, right? Well, I think that it depends on the area in which you're working. I mean, I would, I would, I, I made this joke just a few days ago in talking to a bunch of scientists how, despite the fact that we're trying to learn more and more, there's a little bit of anxiety that we actually learn it all. <laughs> what if we knew everything? Wouldn't that be terrible? <laughs> we wouldn't have anything to do. Of course, in the real world, we're nowhere in any danger of that happening. But you could imagine that if you divided all the different subject matters of science into some large number of fields, that individual fields could be figured out. It would never really happen that all of the possible questions you could ask would be answered, but it could, in principle, happen that all of the underlying principles were absolutely well understood, and it was a matter of applying those principles to the, perfect, to the individual cases you cared about. I don't think that is true in any of the fields of science that we uh, are currently dealing with, but I'm not afraid of it being true. I, you know, I want to know more and more. Maybe someday we'll understand the basics pretty well. There's another element in the book of making the subject matter relatable, which is the use of illustrational examples, whether or not they're literally represented by illustrations. They're sort of analogies to concrete events in the real world. We started out talking about, well, at least a little bit earlier, we talked about the, the sort of kitchen procedures that, that show you what entropy is. How much of an effort was it to find to find new illustrations like this and not have to to avoid having to go to the well of the same sorts of ones popular physics books popular cosmology books bring up quite quite often yeah it was a it's a little bit of a challenge it's a little bit easier for me because the particular subject matter i'm talking about for most of the book with entropy statistical mechanics the arrow of time is not too well Fraud. So at the beginning of the book, there's general relativity, which, which indeed has been covered a million times. In the end of the book, there's cosmology, which is a very popular subject for popular books. But the whole middle section is, you know, we're back in the 19th century, 
uh, with people like Boltzmann and Maxwell and Gibbs, and we followed up with information theory and, and quantum mechanics and things like that, which is not uh, the specific things that I'm talking about just haven't been covered to death, at least in the books that I've been reading. There are books out there, and I don't want to shortchange them. They were very valuable to me uh, when I was writing my own, but, it's, but the 19th century has not been done to death. A lot of popular physics expositions seem to skip from Galileo and Newton right to Einstein and Bohr, and there's a lot of inter- fun stuff in between that I want to emphasize. So I, I did have, I did try to put a lot of effort into coming up with examples, coming up with concrete realizations of things. And for any one principle, there's 20 different examples you could think of, and it's you're afraid a little bit of, of introducing any one because it, it misses aspects of other ones. <laughs> uh, and then you have to go back and say, well, you know, if it's oil and vinegar instead of cream and coffee, then things don't work quite the right way. And, and so there's, there's always some set of compromises. But, you know, I, I do believe that you get ideas across by making them tangible, by bringing them down to earth, by, by showing people examples. It's just for the overwhelming majority of human beings, it's easier to grab, grasp examples than to grasp abstract concepts uh, in their own self. I take it that's something as well that came through quite a bit in the road tests you mentioned before, where people would read the manuscript. I, I have to imagine the examples were more latched on to than many things, because that's certainly what I came away remembering, remembering the most was the specific details of these, uh, in many cases, very vivid, sometimes humorous examples you use. And often reviewers bring them up too, so they seem to have really stuck in the mind of the readers. Well, yeah, um, more than once I used the example of a cat, and I named the cat Miss Kitty, and everyone brings up the existence of Miss Kitty in the book as <laughs> whether or not, you know, a, a valorous thing for making it seem more warm and approachable or a terribly silly um, uh, abdication of my responsibility as a real scientist. So, <laughs> yes, that does stick in people's minds, which in which I think is good. That's the idea, right? I mean... It, it, it does, it's an anchor, and I, as a, as a scientist myself, trying to learn new things, I'm always interested in examples and how things apply, because that's when it steps into focus, when you can not only have the abstract principles, but say, ah, that's what you mean, you mean that when this happens, then this other thing is going to follow. That's when it makes sense to me, and I think that most people are just like that, too. You've mentioned the Miss Kitty issue, and you've mentioned how your prose in the book is different from your prose on the blog when you when you posted blog entries was the was the concern of what tone the book should be was that a major a major thing when you were writing it was that was that something that just developed organically or were, did you have to really decide what tone am i going to aim for for this book no that was a lot of work actually and that was that was probably the single most important role of the feedback that i got from my readers was you know, you know, the tone can can go off kilter in both directions. It, be, it can become too silly and goofy in an attempt to lighten things up. It can also become too serious and ponderous without uh, anything breaking it up and just become work rather than fun to read it. I mean, the ideal book, which I'm, I've fallen short of the ideal book, but absolutely the the perfect book would be one where it was a, it was not just teaching you deep concepts, but it was a page turner. You couldn't get you couldn't wait to get to the next concept that was going to come up. And so I tried to keep it so that, you know, there were either fun examples or somehow breaking up the page with a picture or a quote or something as often as possible to really, you know, I never wanted it to be work to read this book, even though I recognize that the concepts themselves are deep, you know. Professional physicists and philosophers can sit there for hours or or talk with them for days and try to get these things right. So it's not just, you know, it's not candy. You really need to sort of think about some of these things, but I hope that the thinking is fun and brought to life by the various examples and, and picking the right tone in between complete silliness and complete seriousness. <laughs> now, coming away from the book, I I now hold the idea that, or at least I can't really think about any issues of time in depth without my mind also going to cosmology. But a lot of the press the book has received does at least in, in the form of, say, an aside, if not making it their main point, they say that it's quite a bold move to bring cosmology into a book about time. And, and now I feel that it's natural after reading it. So why is that such a bold move? Well, I'm glad you think it's natural, because that is the book serves its purpose then. And, it, it, you know, it's a bold move because it, well, it goes back to the 1870s. And, you know, this was an argument. We had this idea in the early 1800s 
um, about entropy and the arrow of time and the world winding down. The world goes from being sort of more orderly to more disorderly as it goes. But it was vague, and we didn't really know what the word entropy meant and so forth. And it was finally put on a firm footing in the 1870s by Boltzmann because he believed in atoms. And he said, no, if you believe in atoms, it all makes sense. I can explain it. Here you go. But the problem was what Boltzmann could explain is why, starting today, the entropy of the universe goes up into the future, why the universe gets messier and winds down. There's sort of a, you evolve toward a heat death and, and so forth. What he could not explain, why, which is why the entropy was lower yesterday, why the arrow of time has been moving in the same direction in the past as it will in the future. And people have been arguing about that ever since the 1870s with no firm consensus. I think it's clear what the right answer is. I don't think it's a real controversy. I think people are reluctant to believe the answer, but the answer is that you can't on the basis of the fundamental laws of physics, explain this phenomenon all by themselves. You need something extra. You need a statement about how the universe started. It's not enough to start here at our moment today and extrapolate both into the past and into the future, because the underlying laws of physics work equally well in the past and the future, and therefore you will get the same answer. Entropy will go up both toward the past and the future, but that's not right. <laughs> no, that's a conclusion that does not actually fit the data. You need an extra ingredient. That extra ingredient comes from cosmology. Boltzmann himself talked about this. He was aware of the problem. He was aware that this was a likely solution and so forth. And yet, it's been pushed aside. It's not been brought up. There have been people throughout all these years who have understood that and have mentioned it, but there has been a lot, much larger number of people who have brushed it under the rug or not understood it or simply not mentioned it at all, not, not brought about, not brought it up. And so... We're remembering something that people were talking about over a century ago, but it's something that is that people are resistant to because it's not the way they're used to thinking. Is it just resistance because the because as you said they haven't gotten used to it? Is that is that entirely why people are reluctant to to allow cosmology into this into this framework of thought about why time works like it does? Uh, I think it's partly that in the sense that I do believe that. Fifty years from now, everyone will believe this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's that clear that it's true. But it's, uh, but it's not just that they're used to it and they're reluctant to change their minds. It's that the idea that time moves in one direction, the idea that the past is different from the future, that we can remember yesterday but not tomorrow, the, the, the idea that at a deep level causes precede effects. Okay, you do something and then something happens because of that, not the other way around. The idea that we can affect tomorrow by our choices today, but we cannot affect yesterday by our choices today. All these ideas are so deeply ingrained in the way we think about the universe. We, we think not just as cosmologists or physicists, but as people. We think that this is how time works. And to step back sufficiently far to say, you know, it didn't have to be that way. This is a feature of the universe we happen to live in, but it is not ingrained in the fundamental laws of physics. That is actually difficult. That is a conceptually pretty big leap. It's a clear implication of the ideas of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics that have been given to us by Boltzmann and his friends, but nevertheless, it is hard to accept. And if you pick up a textbook on statistical mechanics uh, for graduate students in physics, cosmology is never anywhere in there. Uh, they never say that, oh, you need to understand that the early universe had a low entropy to make sense of this whole picture. And that's because you don't need it to understand going from today toward the future. You can make predictions for the future, no problem. It's understanding the past as well that requires this extra boundary condition. So it's very counterintuitive. It's very far from our everyday experience. And you don't need to understand this part of the puzzle if you just want to make predictions for what will happen next. So a lot of people just don't want to bother to make that intellectual leap. So when you're dealing with physics, time is assumed, and thus cosmology, you wouldn't necessarily need to think about it unless you were moving that one step to the next level up. Well, I think that, you know, the way that it's because of the arrow of time, because there is a difference between the past and the future, the way that we think about time is trying to predict the future. We think that the past is finished, right? The past is in the books. We can try to reconstruct the past. We can try to remember it or find memories or records of it that allow us to say what happened. 
But if you if you think about how physicists or other scientists talk about the scientific method, they talk about making predictions. They don't talk about making retrodictions of the past. They talk about doing experiments where they set something up and then predicting what will happen in the future. So almost in the logic of the scientific method, as it is conventionally constructed, there's an arrow of time. You're talking about starting things today and predicting what's going to happen next. And again, sort of stepping out of that framework, looking at the whole universe through time all at once and trying to make sense of it is only when you would begin to realize that, oh, I need to understand the very beginning of the universe make sense of all of its subsequent moments. Tell me if this is true or not, but it seems like it must have felt extremely lucky when talking about the arrow of time and the reversibility or perhaps the, 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 the way that the, presence, the present perspective on time and all that. Talking about that, it must have seemed lucky that you could get into a discussion of time machines and why time machines probably don't work just because that's such, that's such a relatable concept to people. Well, there was, there was controversy both in my mind and in other people I talked to about how much I should get into that oh. subject. Um, it was fun for me because I've worked on time travel, on time machines in general relativity. I've written papers about it. And so it was something I knew about and had thought about. And I know that, you know, people relate to it, right? You know, people um, like the idea of time travel, at least as a thought experiment kind of thing, where they can ask what would happen and so forth. And... I, I was tempted to put it in the book just because I wanted people to understand how time works at some broad level. But the nice thing was, when I sat down to think about it, there's a very clear, non-forced connection between time travel and the arrow of time, which is that the reason why traveling backwards in time seems paradoxical to us, raises all these logical puzzles, is because we're so used to there being a uniform arrow of time that points in the same direction for everybody. But if you can travel to the past, then your personal future is someone else's past, and therefore it's hard to define an arrow of time, and that's what gets us into trouble. So they are absolutely connected. I'm not, uh, I hope that that came through in the discussion in the book, but I think that time travel ultimately serves a very good purpose as illustrating the extent to which this directionality of time is so embedded in how we think about things that it's hard to escape that way of thinking. The concept of time travel is one that I that I read brought up occasionally in philosophy books, illustrating certain certain examples of the way the author happens to be thinking about a problem or an issue. And I believe in another interview, you described yourself as one of a small subset of scientists who also happens to be interested in philosophy. Now, first I should ask, why is that subset small? Well, you don't need to know much philosophy to be a good scientist. And just like most philosophers are not philosophers of science. There's a, there's a small overlap on both sides. Um, you know, it, it's also, let me put it in a more tangible example, you don't need to know how to shoot a free throw to be a really good free throw shooter or to hit a baseball. Uh -huh. It's, a, it's a, 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 the practice of this particular um, thing is completely disconnected from being able to explain how it works. You know, it can exist in your body and in your subverbal mind in a way that makes you a very, very effective baseball player, but you couldn't be a ba very good baseball coach. And likewise, physicists don't know, don't need to know the philosophy of science to get through their, their practice as scientists. In fact, some of the most embarrassingly bad statements about the philosophy of science are made by working scientists. And partly it's just because, you know, thinking about the philosophy of science, how, philosophy, how science works, is not the same as doing science. It's doing science on science itself, and it's just as hard as doing science on cosmology or plants or um, organic chemistry or anything like that. It's a, it's, a, it's a robust and mature field in its own right. So you don't need it, and it's hard, and nevertheless, a lot of scientists think that because they've been doing science, they're qualified to make pronouncements on the philosophy of science. And, you know, a lot of philosoph some philosophers of science say silly things, just like some scientists say silly things. So there's a, you know, small overlap. I think the best philosophers of science understand some of the problems in current science better than any of the scientists do. Uh, philosophers of science are extremely good at diagnosing gaps in our explanatory structures, whereas physicists can often just... Um, brush over those and run on to the next problem. What 
philosophers of science are not as good at is proposing new theories to fix those gaps. That's where scientists are really good at what they do. So I think you need both kinds of people. And with you personally, someone who does science and someone who has an interest in the philosophy of science, what does that combination give you, do you think? Well, it certainly gives me an appreciation for which problems need to be solved. Um, you know, it, it, there's a certain kind of attitude you can take as a physicist that if you don't need to know the solution to a certain problem to get on your everyday life, then you're going to worry about other problems. Now, I'm not sure this is an intellectually respectable stance to take because you could avoid doing all of physics that way. You probably don't need to know any of these things. You need to pick and choose what problems are important to you. But I think that if you, if, uh, you, know, if you listen to um, philosophers talk about they're trying to make rigorous sense of the sometimes casual explanations that physicists give for certain things, and oftentimes the casual explanations are clearly reflecting some underlying absolutely rigorous understanding, other times they're clearly patching over some gaps that you're missing. So I learn a lot talking to philosophers in terms of what needs to be explained, and that helps guide me in choosing what research to work on. I want to ask about the way you're continuing to engage with the public about this subject, even after the publication of the book, because, of course, on Cosmic Variance, you're running a, a book club going chapter by chapter in From Eternity to Here. And what have you learned from this project so far? It's extreme. Well, the most embarrassing thing I learned is that I made a huge mistake in Chapter uh, 5. Ah. <laughs> I said something very untrue about general relativity. It's kind of embarrassing. I mean, the general thing I was trying to illustrate is certainly true. But then I picked an example. Like you said, it's the examples that are vivid. And I picked an example where the general principle I was trying to illustrate is not true. So that's you know absolutely invaluable feedback that I get from people. And hopefully I will learn. We're sort of just now in the course of the book club getting to what I think of as the interesting part of the book, where we get into the details of entropy and what it means and how to explain it. So I'm hoping to get a better understanding myself of what is it that people are willing to go with, you know, what is it they, which concepts they get easily and say, yes, okay, let's, let's, we understand that, let's move on, versus which ones are the stumbling blocks, which, what are the ideas that people really have difficulty accepting. And, you know, of course, I really hope to learn something myself about not just mistakes that I might have made in the book, but come to a better understanding myself of some of the puzzles that we're wrestling with here, because it's certainly not true that I understand everything in the subject. This is a good example of how you are both a science writer, a science print writer, and a science blogger. And I occasionally hear chatter about, actually more as time goes by, about who is going to quote-unquote win? Will it be the science writers or will it be the science bloggers? As somebody who does both those things, what can you say about this, about this debate or this mutual worry that goes on with bloggers and writers about science? Well, people love categories, and they love putting things into categories even when they don't easily fit. Um, I am a scientist who happens to blog. I know other bloggers who are not scientists and never left blogging about science. And there's journalists who are not bloggers in, by some ordinary definition who are writing about science. And, you know, I think the more the merrier in some very easy way to say it. We should all be doing uh, this kind of thing. Different people like different kinds of writing, different kinds of subject, and it's all fun and useful, and let's get along as one big happy family. <laughs> However, you know, in the there's a long-term evolution of this game where... It's not just one big happy family. Some people need to get paid. You know, some people like me do this as a hobby. Uh, I'm a scientist. I get paid for doing research in science, and then I blog on and off when I find the time because I think it's fun. But there's there are journalists whose job it is, or writers whose job it is to do work in interviewing people, and visiting labs, and following new discoveries, and trying to figure out the best ways to interpret them for a wider audience. And I think it would be a huge tragedy if those people were somehow undermined by, by people like me, by, people, you know, by scientists blogging. And the reason why is because I'm not going to do work to put together a long feature-length <laughs> story on something that is not my own research, right? I mean, it's to, to really do that effort is, uh, takes a tremendous amount of dedication as well as the craft of writing. You get very few science bloggers who understand the pyramid structure of a good newspaper article or something like that, or, and, you know, Let's not even go into the spelling and the grammar, which is not always uh, a high priority. So 
I certainly think that the society needs to find a way to support the effort of professional journalism, whether it's science journalism or any other kind of journalism. And I think the newspapers and TV news shows, which have traditionally done it, are in trouble. You know, they're they're losing support because the advertising on which they're based has you know gone migrated to other forums. So I don't know what it's going to be. I think it will happen. I, I am optimistic that. 20 or 50 years from now, we, we will settle into a new equilibrium where people do get paid to do this hard work of real journalism and writing. Uh, but I'm not exactly sure how it's going to happen, so I'm crossing my fingers. The name of the book, once again, is From Eternity to Here, the quest for the ultimate theory of time. Sean Carroll, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. If you'd like more information on Sean Carroll, visit preposterousuniverse.com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. You can hear any show in our archive or see other fun stuff at our website, colinmarshallradio.com. The website of Ben Althaus, the man who produces our theme music, is at benalthaus.com. If you have any feedback of any kind, positive, negative, neutral, questions, comments, anything, send that along to colin at colinmarshallradio.com. Thank you for tuning in, and we will catch you next time.